Deputy Speaker. Any other member? Uh, Deputy Speaker? Yes, Mr. Speaker. You have your Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minutes? Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, let me say that as a former hotelier who worked for many years at the executive level in the tourist industry, we always viewed one complaint as one far too many. Mr. Speaker, I say this to the whole Bermuda and the rest of the 35 members of this chamber, that we cannot take people for granted. People don't have to come Bermuda. There are other places to go. So let's not take an approach that what I say goes. Tourism does not work like that. That's all I'll say on that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, earlier this week, the president of the Bermuda Industrial Union on behalf of the membership released a document. And in the document, under H, it says free college education for students up to $40,000 a year. Mr. Speaker, I'm a proponent of that, that, that writing. And one, one second. One may ask why, Mr. Speaker, many of our children at the start of the education system in this country were deprived of a proper education by the government of the day and endorsed by the chief occupant of government house. Now, some may get annoyed at because I'm bringing up history. Well, I didn't write the history. And one thing about history will not go away. But I believe that in order to know where you are, you must know where you came from and how you got to where you are. Mr. Speaker, what I'm, what I'm about to say is, is not no speculation or stuff off the top of my head. This is written in the history books. Mr. Speaker, when we had, when blacks, Negroes, the two thirds of the student population, we received only 18% of government funds. The other schools received 82%. This again was endorsed, endorsed, endorsed by government house. Mr. Speaker, there was a time that black children could not take the test to be a Rhodes Scholar because they thought that black children weren't endowed to have academic abilities or a business acumen. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we've had a member of the education board in those days um, who said, one said, trying to educate some people was like knocking their heads against a stern wall. Then another chairman of the board of education said, it's useless to provide secondary education for certain children because they were not endowed by the almighty to absorb such an education. Mr. Speaker, I don't, that doesn't happen today, I don't think so. But the effects of what happened during those times affect us today. And it, it, it has something to do with the, the behavior of some of our young people. Because their parents and their parents, grandparents were deprived of a proper education because of who they were. Mr. Speaker, we were entrusted during those days. In fact, under the Board of Education in those days, white schools were encouraged to have boards and to run their own schools. We had to come under the auspices of the Board of Education. So they set our curriculum and everything else like that. And I'll venture out to say that 
when Dr. Kenneth Robinson went about trying to fix that, he met up into some, some unfriendly fire. Like they took his mortgage, even though he paid, he was not, he never missed a payment, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, during that time, schools applied for government funds to carry out extensions or renovations in the schools. Barclay, in 1933, applied for some money, to government money, to do some extensions. And the government of the day, endorsed by the governor at that time, said, we'll give you the money, but you must have our people on the board. So the Barclay board was controlled by whites. Yet, the same procedure as far as giving money, applying money, giving money to white schools, that was not required, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that takes me back to, I think it was probably two or two, when the new Barclay was built. And because a black firm got that contract, was awarded the contract, every day they was on that site, it was almost like holy hell. The comments, the articles in the front page of the newspaper was not encouraging, it was criticism. But Mr. Speaker, eventually that black firm was terminated after completing 83% of the school, the $68 million contract. Mr. Speaker, when they were terminated, $17 million was left unspent, and 17% of the school had to be complete. Well, they gave the contract to a white construction firm, Mr. Speaker, and that construction firm spent more than the black firm built 83% of the school for. 83% of the school cost. 50, 51 million dollars. To complete the other 17 percent, it cost over 60 million dollars. Then there were, there were no special reports. There was no criticism from the royal percent. In fact, when the, the uh, white firm went to work up there, they was awarded the contract after the proactive was terminated. All criticism in the newspaper stuff. So even though this happened in 1933, it happened again in 2002 with these, this crowd, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it was then Howard, in fact, at one time we had, we had about, um, 10, no, 11 secondary schools. Eight were white, three were black, and in that black was our academy. That, uh, that school was founded by and so a white guy named Mr. Skinner. What bless his soul. But Mr. Speaker, when white schools were awarded 50 pounds per child, black schools were awarded 10 pounds per child. And the point I'm trying to make is that that's why I think for the next decade, we should be affording all those kids, predominantly blacks, who were denied proper education, whether it be facilities, whether it be funds. We need to fix that. You want to call it a, a part of reparations, then call it that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I do know my good friends from the white supremacist group, they'll be taking me to task in the, in the blogs. And that's fine with me, Mr. Speaker, because 
Let me say this to, to you, Mrs. Speaker. I don't live as a racist. I don't act as a racist. Nor do I think as a racist. Now, that may be disappointing to them. But I will call a spade a spade, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, that's, again, I'm, I'm supporting the position of the president on behalf of the workers of this country represented by the Community Industrial Union for free education for the next decade for our children because of the history of the system when it, when it was first started in Bermuda. We've been deprived, we've been left out, we've been to everything. And it's about time we start to make up for that. Because as you probably know, many, many of our parents today struggle. They struggle very hard to pay, to send children overseas. Some children cannot go. And Mr. Speaker, I don't know if I'm about this right, but most times the recipients of scholarships are people that's got a, maybe a three, three point GPA. They'll get it before somebody got a 2.5 or 2.4. Now, I believe that once that student qualifies to go to university, regardless of the GPA, they should get those funds. And that's why I will continue to say that our students need to be need to be given free university education for the next 10 years to make up for what the parents, the grandparents, and the great grandparents didn't, didn't have. Because let me say this, Mr. Speaker, your education today was based on the foundation that your great grandfather, your grandfather and father and that's what they had or what they didn't have. So we gotta fix that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for this time and this privilege. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm.